Okay, I'm going to continue OS Dev. Um, before I get in fully started, I have a couple of small changes here that I forgot to do when I was recording, so I'm recording now. <laughs> but I'm on a different, you know, virtual machine now, 64-bit. Ooh. Flat Assembler, or FASM, was not available as a package out of the gate. I could download it, but I was like, you know, what changes would be needed for NetWide Assembler instead? Because I do want to move to that and just using that. And it turned out, um, just because it's more widely supported and portable on, on things that I've tested. But Flat Assembler is good. I just, you know, Net, NetWide Assembler has a little bit more support. But the changes needed to support NetWide as opposed to Flat Assembler is very, very minimal. So, and that's just the changes I've laid out here. Uh, in the git diff in the make file, instead of the phasm line here, I changed it to netwide assembler line. So just dash f bin. So the format is going to be binary file output given the source directory assembly file. And then I'm just sending the output to dev null. So that's for both instantiations or whatever. Both times that the assembler is called, just change the phasm line to nasm. So in here, if it makes more sense looking at it in context, under reset file table, that's changed now to netwide assembler. And under the assembly file, it's changed. So that was small. Um, I added a little thing to clear up the sector number and make clean as well. Down here, just because I was forgetting that if something messed up, that was left within the directory. So just cleaning that up. Uh, the other changes were in the second stage bootloader, which I guess is not there because I have to do that. Under dot length, and it doesn't take the dot in there. That's nice. That's okay. So at the bottom here under dot length, this was equal. These are all equal signs, but that does not work. This does not work within netwide assembler, but the EQU does. So just EQU instead of equal there. And then I don't need these comments anymore because I'm not using flat assembler now. And the only, the only other change, and then those two changes was in the term u 18 in file. Um, I used to, well, you can't see them now, so there's no point in going here, but I used to have comments out here beside, you know, like this all the way at the bottom or beside the capital F and other things. Right now it's just data. Not from Star Trek, but just data. So instead of having comments out beside the lines that I had, uh, NetWide Assembler didn't like that for some reason. It said it couldn't compile the data. There's extra data on the line or something. So I had to get rid of comments for, I guess, the ampersand and the capital F that I was showing as an example a while back. Uh, I, I just had to get rid of those comments, and the NetWide Assembler works, so we're good. But those are the only changes there. They're just, they're very minimal, but they were there. I'll just add those in so I don't forget. Um, there is one other change that I'm going to do. <laughs> one last change I'm going to do in uh, as part of the build process in the add file table entry show file. I was testing this out on FreeBSD, and it did not build by default because whatever, well, it comes with bash by default, but also POSIX shell over there. It did not like, I'm using these hex numbers, these hex directives with printf, it just printed like the slash x as a literal in the character. So it printed this out as a character of slash x in the sector number. It did not print the, you know, numeric binary bytes for the number to put it into the file table file. So that was not good, that didn't work. But I did find that printf works with octal, and Octal seems to be more widely supported. So for the purposes of portability, I'm going to change these hex directive things, these escape codes to Octal, which is going to be a slash zero instead of a slash X. This percent B will still actually um, escape this first and treat it as an Octal number. So it'll print an Octal zero normally, except in the shell, an Octal zero is counted as a null, and this won't print anything. If I try to make a file, and I, well, I can try echoing as well. Echo or printf. We do like octal bytes to a file um, test, a test file here. And we try to read test. It's not going to have anything in it. It'll have a, um, well, it'll have a new line <laughs> because echo puts a new line. We get rid of that. Dash in to suppress that. So it puts, well, that actually did put a zero, so I guess I'm lying to you. In FreeBSD, that counted as a null byte, and it didn't echo anything, which is interesting. So I wonder if it does that in printf as well, actually. But I know it did not work in, it might work within OpenBSD. That would be nice, wouldn't it? 
Yeah, it works in OpenBSD. I swear FreeBSD didn't work, but I can sanity check that because I was testing things with that. Uh, this is FreeBSD. If you don't believe me, this is just normal TWM with Xorg. Yeah, in FreeBSD, it doesn't even make the file. So <laughs> printf is different between uh, shells. That's good for portability, but you can use DD, and that's what I'm going to end up using. Just take from dev zero, um, block size of one, count equals one, and by default, that'll print to standard in or standard out, I guess, right here. I didn't put that into a file, so it didn't make anything. I was messing with um, like sound stuff, but. That doesn't make a file, but if you redirect the output, then it does make a file, and we have a test, and test has a zero byte. So I'm going to be using DD because that is going to be more uh, portable between environments here. Uh, but I do OpenBSD because I'm fancy like that. That's cool that, that this actually works in OpenBSD, but this is counted as an octal number, so I'm just saying I'm going to change the, the hex stuff to octal, is all I'm trying to say in my spiel here. Uh, but for portability, I'm going to change that to DD. Taken from dev zero. Okay, so instead of percent %x here for hex, I'm going to do octal, convert decimal to octal string. Instead of slash x, I'm going to do backslash zero. Output octal string is numeric by its, instead of the zero x, it's going to be just a zero. You can do that for the prefix. Convert octal string to decimal string. Can add those. That's fine. This would be percent O or for yeah percent O, not percent zero. <laughs> That's not going to work. These need to be O. O for octal. And then the last one again. That'll be a zero. Okay. I could also replace some of these echo-ns like this. Could probably change that. Since this sector number is going to be decimal, that's a decimal string, so I could change this probably to make that decimal. Hopefully this works and I'm not breaking anything, but we'll see. And this echo up here can be printf as well. We'll just print a character space to the file. Okay. We'll see if that builds. I mean, because I haven't tried those two changes, it might break now. And I didn't hide the output, so let me change that. Did not hide the output within DD, which is status equals none. There we go. Now we don't get that. And it looks to a build, but I'm just going to double check here. Again, so yeah, 1121. So that looks correct. Okay. And I think we're good. All right. So it builds. It builds with octal set. And that was just so I can run it the exact same way, build and run it on OpenBSD and FreeBSD, if not maybe other shells. So there's other portability things I need to look into. Let me know. But that was one major one using Octal and switching a couple changes for NetWide Assembler. But the actual thing I want to do for this video is um, a couple of PIC interrupts. So sort of hardware interrupts. Um, I want to do IRQ0 for the programmable interval timer. Just be able to set different frequency rates for timer things. I'll probably use a default uh, when the OS boots. Probably like a one millisecond rate, so every millisecond I'll have the IRQ go. I know by default it's like one point something megahertz, which is like microseconds, maybe millionth, like a million times a second, and then a millisecond would be a thousand times a second. But I just that's easier if I want to implement like a sleep syscall. I can sleep for a given number of milliseconds or regular seconds if I just multiply by a thousand. So I think I'm going to do that. I've set up an IRQ0 for the programmable interval timer and a sleep syscall, just a really basic setup. And then I can mess with the PC speaker in the next video or some other one in the future because that'll use channel 2 of the PIT. Um, other than IRQ0, I might do IRQ1 for the keyboard and IRQ8 for uh, reading the CMOS RTC or real time clock values to get like date time on the screen. But I'll start with PIT for IRQ0. 
which I can bring out. Well, that's RTC, but programmable interval timer, the PIT chip. Uh, it's an oscillator at a given frequency. It has a, I don't know what prescaler means. <laughs> three independent frequency dividers. So it has three channels that you can divide the initial frequency by to get whatever you want a frequency to be. So a certain number of hertz you can set for like the PC speaker for some rudimentary sound output or for just timing things. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna divide this initial rate of 1.19 blah 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 megahertz i'm going to divide that by a number to get 1000 set that as the frequency divider and then we'll have a one millisecond rate or a 1000 hertz rate after that so basically you can send a number to the pit and it will for a given channel there's three channels that you get by writing to data ports but if you get if you put a given number to one of those ports it will divide this initial megahertz number by that number and it will set that channel to that given hertz after it's divided, that given frequency. So we're going to be setting channel 0 for the main IRQ0 interrupt for the pick, because channel 0 is connected to that one. Channel 1 isn't really used, apparently, so we're not going to mess with that. Channel 2 can be used to set PC speaker output, so we might mess with that in the next episode or something. But PIT has some I.O. ports, channel 0, 1, and 2 data ports. We're right, at 40, 41, 42. 43 is the command port, which you just write to. Well, actually, no. The single byte you send to the command port is in this layout here. So you select the channel and the high two bits of the byte. You set the access mode, which I'm going to be doing just low byte and high byte right now because I want to be able to send sort of granular frequencies I, wanted to, I want to divide by. And the most granular you can do is 16-bit numbers up to 65535. So you need two bytes for a 16-bit number, and we, we, it has an access mode for that, low byte, high byte, so I'll just set 4 and 5 to 1. Um, the operating mode determines sort of what frequency it's generating, kind of what mode it's set in for that channel that you want to set. Um, I'll be doing mode 2 for the IRQ0 timer because that gives a little bit better um, accuracy or precision, a little bit better precision. Um, than the square wave generator. But square wave is also good as well if you don't need as much precision. Or if you want to do the PC speaker with channel 2, it works by using the square wave. The mode 2 kind of switches too fast for the PC speaker, but mode 3 works for that. So channel 2 in the future, I can do mode 3. But for this video, I'm going to do mode 2 as a regular rate generator uh, for timing purposes. Um, you can also do timers and other things differently, depending if you want to do like a one shot, which only gives you like one timer instead of resetting. Otherwise, by default, if you do mode two or three, or maybe these other ones, it'll reset the counter every time. So if you say, if you want to set like 1000 hertz for like a millisecond timer, so you send 1000 to this port, well, you send whatever channel. So these two bits will be zero. We'll send low byte, high byte. And we'll send mode 2, and then we'll send a 0, sorry, as the first byte. Didn't go over this. For 16-bit binary, x86 doesn't really use 4-digit BCD. That can only be 0 to 9999. There's not really a point. So if you put 0 here, you can get the full 16-bit uh, numbers to divide the default frequency by. So we'll be doing that. If you set all that up, then you send the, the frequency divider that you want to the channel port. So we send a byte with these values to the mode command register, hex 43 port, and then the byte uh, for a low byte first and then a high byte, we'll send the low byte of our frequency divider to 40 and then the high byte to 40, and that'll divide the default frequency of 1.193182 megahertz by whatever we send in those two bytes. Okay, that's a mouthful and I haven't typed anything, so if it doesn't make sense, that's okay. Um, but there's more, you know, this goes through all the modes and everything. But anyway, I'll, ch I'll try and go through and set that up. Not in FreeBSD, in the other one. Try to go through and set that up here. So in the kernel, which we don't want to call this before it's all set up. Or actually, we want to, <laughs> we want to get the code that actually handles the IRQ you know, before we set it up. But I'll just put the code here, otherwise I'm liable to forget where I have this to add the ISRs for pick interrupts. I already have this here. Hey, timer IRQ handler. So I'll have a function here for that. It'll be IRQ zero, so I'll just put a zero there. Timer IRQ zero handler, that's, that's fine. That makes enough sense. 
one for the keyboard. I'm going to have one later for, um, for the RTC. I'll just type that in our Q8 handler. Okay. Then to enable the timer by default, I'll clear the zero mask. So in the pick, the first interrupt, IRQ0, will actually be able to be fired at this point. So until we do this, we're not going to get interrupts. But I can at least set up a, a function to be set. If we enable it by default, it's going to still be set by the BIOS. So it will still be 18.2 hertz, 18.2 times per second. Because the BIOS sets that. The BIOS effectively divides the default 1.19 megahertz frequency by the maximum number you can give it, 65535 or 65536. If you send zero as the divider, it'll take it as the max, but it essentially does that. So 119382 divided by 6553, either 35 or 36, but it gives you around 18, and the BIOS does this by default, so you get the default rate of 18 hertz from that initial 1.19 millihertz number and then yeah this is set so i don't need that to do that is here so i can have a really basic irq handler that just goes and does nothing <laughs> i could do that to start i guess so that'll be in the in the pick.h i'll put it within here uh, just at the bottom that's fine it was um timer irq zero IRQ0 handler, I think I called it. So I'll just do that. And right now it's not going to do anything. So send pick EOI 0, because this will be IRQ0, and that will end up sending the EOI command to the command port, which is just hex 20 I've laid out. So that's all good. So that shouldn't do anything right now. We're just ending the interrupt right when it starts effectively. But at least we have a function to handle that. AT timer, speed channel zero, IRQ zero, pick IRQ zero. Actually, we can't do this, sorry. <laughs> I need a little bit more because this is technically an interrupt, right? I think I need the, the interrupt stuff. Let me put that back up a little bit. So it's attribute, double underscore. It's been a while since I've done this. Attribute interrupts, and that will end up sending the interrupt frame. So that will be actually the thing that it takes in here. I don't have the keyword completion. That's lame, because I have, well, I don't have it included. That's why. OK, I'll have to include that. Um, we should be in the interrupts folder already. Right, because this is one level up. Now, this is from the make file. So if we go to include, we're in this folder. But I have to go back up to interrupts and back in. Okay, back into IDT. Yeah, okay. Which is kind of useless here. The only reason I'm doing that is to add in this in frame 32, yeah, in frame 32T, I didn't want that equal sign there, frame. I'm not gonna use the values in this, but I need to add it because that's what's sent in the form of an interrupt. That, that, that data will be on the stack, so I have to include that here because this is a pick interrupt, which is an interrupt, it's at hex 20. But by default, we're not gonna do anything with the timer right now. And since I added that handler in the, kernel we should be good to go set this here and we're clearing the mask okay so nothing should happen when we when we run it um, other than me failing to do an identifier i thought that was in the idt i guess it's not oh it's int gate flags okay not int flags Interrupt gate flags. Okay. But again, this should do nothing. But effectively, within um, within QEMU, the PIT does not run at well. It runs at the eighteen hertz a second rate. I'm pretty sure, but it does not really run at faster rates. Like if we, if we set 
the rate of like one megahertz. The QEMU doesn't pick that up. Um, of course, I'm not showing how fast it goes right now anyway, because I don't have anything on the screen. Uh, but I just wanted to show that, that nothing is affected by enabling that interrupt since it immediately goes back. But uh, the default rate is going to be 18 hertz a second. Or, that's a lot. 18 hertz. Yeah, 18 per second. And since I didn't make clean, I have all that garbage there. So I'll do that. Uh, but okay, I'll, what if I want to like show some output just to make sure we know what, what rate the things are going at? I can do that. What rate the PIT is sending the IRQ at. I'm also going to comment these out so I don't have that stuff on the screen anymore. I'm going to get rid of this later, so I'll just put like debugging or whatever. Because it will definitely make performance a lot worse if we're trying to print stuff out on the screen. So, <laughs> like that won't be good. But I'm going to print out a message on the screen just to uh, to show this. I don't know, put it like 50, I'll just put it at the top of the screen. 50 and 0 is fine. Uh, but if I want to do this, I need to include printing. So print print types, yeah, dex and y, so I'll print out um, irq0 timer ticks, we'll do that. This will be print decimal and then I'll print the number. I don't have a number to print, okay, so let's put a number here. Make it static so it stays initial. So when it comes into here, I'll just update that when it ends. I know there's better ways to do debugging as well. I was researching that. So, I mean, I could set like an if, if def for this or have like an, an environment variable for debug and stuff that I could conditionally compile this whenever I'm doing stuff like this. I might do that in the future. I'm just not used to that yet for, for projects. But if we want to do that, then we'll print out the ticks value here. So that'll just increment by one every time this is called, and it should print it on the screen. So performance might be massively degraded, but at 18 times a second, it shouldn't be too bad. If we include semicolons. Hopefully not too bad, we'll see. Just take the defaults here. Um, it printed off the screen. <laughs> Good. I don't know what I'm doing anyway. Good. Because I did X and X. It needs to be X and Y. The XXX to the YYY. Yeah. That's kind of how coordinates work. Can you tell it's a little bit late? <laughs> so there we go. So this should be approximately 18 per second that this number should be going up by. Although QEMU doesn't have the most accurate timing systems, especially on OpenBSD because it's usually slower, but that should be around about 18 per second. That just shows that, hey, the thing is working. It is actually incrementing a tick count. Um, Box I've found is usually a bit more accurate in its timings, even though it, it doesn't update as fast because it's, you know, less performance. Um, that's a lot more than 18 per second, actually. The box might have a different default rate for the PIT. Anyway, we can, re we can change the, the IRQ0 rate anyway, so that doesn't matter. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to have a thing to change the rate. This just shows that, hey, this works by default, and I'll leave it in because I'm going to check how the rate changes here. So change. Um, when I say rate, I mean like the frequency that the PIT channels are going at. That's what, that's what I meant to say. So change PIT channel frequency. Okay, I'll just, I'll just call it that, but this one I'm going to make it a little bit verbose because it helped me <laughs> remember it. So I'm going to call this function set PIT channel mode frequency. Just do frequency. So I'm going to take in a channel I'm going to take in a mode, and I will take in a frequency, which can only be 16-bit at max. 
Okay. Okay, what I'm going to do here is, um, basically, I'm going to copy-paste, like, as a comment what the OS dev page has over, like, the bits for the command ports. So I'm going to do that. Um, I guess right before that, I'm just going to cancel out. If they didn't send a correct channel number, I don't really care. Because um, channel can only be 0, 1, or 2. And I'm not really going to be reading and writing, like, the latch command So I'd, right now. So right now, I don't have a reason to read to um, port 43. So if the, if the channel they send is over 2, I'm not going to care. Um, the mode number can be 0 to 8, so that's fine. I guess I could check that as well, though. So if channel is greater than 2, or mode is greater than 7. Mode can be 0 through 7. It's 3 bits. So yeah, channels over 2 or modes greater than 7, I'm just going to not worry about that. Invalid data or something. Invalid input. Frequency can be any valid 16-bit number, though, so that's fine. Including a special value of 0, which will be technically the max, and make it 18. 0.2 hertz, but okay, I'm just going to put a comment here saying, you know, the same stuff as OS dev has, so. All right, we're back. Got the whole comment here laid out just for the bits for the command port and just the ports there at the top because I'll forget, so this is good for internal documentation. Put a clear interrupt statement here and put a set interrupt statement at the bottom because that's what QEMU had, or that's what OS dev wiki had. It had a CLI for setting these values. So I'm just going to have a CLI and an, and an STI at the end. Make sure nothing else interrupts anything when we're setting the PIT. So I'll set those up here. Just clear the interrupt and we'll set the interrupt. Okay, but in between those I'm going to actually set the things here. So the first thing I'm going to do is, you know, send send the command byte to the command port, which is port 43. Just to make things a little easier, but I'll send that here. So to port 43, I want to send um, the values, these bits that are set up that are passed in. So we're sending in an 8-bit channel number, which will be 0, 1, or 2, a mode number, which will be the access mode here. I guess I could call that access mode. Um, that'll be 0 to 3. Actually, no, this will be set by default. The access mode will be 0 to 7, or um, the operating mode is what I'm sending in. I guess to make, to make that a little clearer, I could call this operating mode, because I'm confusing myself right now, as you can hear. <laughs> I'm not tired. It's not late at night. So I'm going to send the operating mode as the second thing here, which will be 0 through 7. So actually, I don't really care what this mode number is. Let me get rid of that. I only care if we're doing the channel 0, 1, or 2. Okay. So I'm always going to be setting the low byte, high byte access mode just to get the full 16-bit value. So this, these two bits will always be 1s, and I'm always going to be having 0 for the first bit here. But otherwise, I'm just going to shift things over to get the right bit values. So the channel will be in the top two bits, which starts at bit 6 and then goes for two bits to bit 7. I can just do channel shift right shift left by six or multiplied by 64 is that what that is but shift shift left by six that'll put it up into bits six and seven if it's zero one or two and then we'll bitwise or some things with that we'll send the the access mode will just be one one or three does c have if i do like zero b is that binary can i do that <laughs> that might make more sense or i can just do zero x three I'm not sure whichever one matters, um, but we'll be shifting that left by four to fit into the two access mode bits, and then I'll send the mode, which is operating mode, shift left by one, because that will fit three bits into bits one, two, and three. Okay. And then otherwise we'll just have a zero, so we don't really need to shift a zero over by zero. It'll al already be a, a zero here, so don't need to mess with that. And this will put one byte with these bits set out to this port. Okay, so then we have to send the, um, send the frequency divider to the channel, to the input channel. Okay, which is just the, because I'm sending low byte and high byte, so I'll put this always sending 
low buy it, high buy it for access mode. Okay. So we're going to be sending two things, the low byte first and then the high byte value. So since we are getting in a UNT16 here for frequency, um, we can just, you know, shift that over by eight for the low byte, for the high byte, <laughs> and just take this for the low byte. So I'm gonna be doing that. And that will be to the channel that we set. So the channel is going to be offset from 40. 40 is channel zero. And if we're only expecting 0, 1, or 2, I could just add that number to 40. So I'll just do that. 40 plus the channel we sent. And the bytes I will send will be the frequency. I called it frequency, yeah. So I could either bitwise and this with FF, and then shift it right by 8. And then bitwise and that with FF within parentheses. So this should get an 8 bit value. I think OS Dev Wiki used the UNT8, like type cast or pun or whatever you do. It's called like type punning, type punting. Um, it'd be good, it'd be good if I could type parentheses. So <laughs> so either you can, you know, bitwise and it with just 8 bits to get the 8 bit value, or you can just do this and not do this. I think this reads a little bit cleaner. I'm not sure about performance or compiler optimization characteristics or anything. I don't, I don't know any differences like with that, but I just think this reads a little bit cleaner and neater if I do this instead of anding with FF. So I might do this for, sometimes I'll do this for things, sometimes I'll do the other. Um, but in this case, I'm just gonna, you know, cast it to a, an unsigned character here. So I think that reads a little neater, but we'll just send the frequency there. We'll set back the interrupts that should be set and we're good to go. That's just a sort of interface to setting the PIT values. So I'm going to have a call to that within the kernel. We're including PIC, so that's all right, which includes this, but it's, it's whatever. That's fine. <laughs> so since I'm setting, you know, interrupts by default in the kernel um, up here, so well down here after i'm clearing the mask i'm setting interrupts anyway but inside here i'm clearing and setting interrupts i'm just going to include that after here i'll put that here set default um bit timer although that's a you know that's redundant right i don't have to put timer just like ftp protocol is redundant and http protocol you know set the default timer irq zero rate i'm going to set it to around a thousand hertz. So how would I do that? I have to send a frequency divider of a 16-bit number. So if I want to divide, I'll just do standard so we get decimal points, but if I want to divide this and get 1000, then we have to send this number effectively. I'm not going to send floating point numbers, so I'm just going to send 1193 as the divider. So 1193182 divided by 1193 is going to give us, you know, slightly over a thousand but it's close enough who cares so i'm going to be doing that and the number you send will be the number that the frequency is divided by so i'm going to send 1193 i'm going to send 1193 as the input frequency parameter to this so channel mode frequency um, channel is going to be channel zero operating mode i'm going to do a rate generator which is number two this down here, just going to do a rate generator. You can do square wave as well, but square wave really only uses even numbers as the frequency dividers, which is explained on the OS Dev Wiki page. I forgot to, to go over um, under the operating mode. Square wave generator does, you know, output high and then low, high, low. The counter in, in the PIT and the IRQ0 that is sent out only really registers when input goes high. Oh, here we go. Yeah, when choosing an operating mode, it's useful to remember IRQ0 is generated by the rising edge, so it's edge triggered from low to high. It's the rising edge. The falling edge would be going high to low, but it's the rising edge. So if you do a square wave, that it only it only effectively goes out when it goes high, and since it only goes high sort of half the time, because it goes high, low, high, low as a square, it's only really going to take even numbered frequency rate dividers 
you can send an odd number, but it'll just take like, I think the number before that, it'll make it even. So it doesn't really matter. And this is like minutia that really, you, you don't really need to worry about, I guess. But if you want to, you know, get the super accuracy rate, you can do the rate generator mode two, and that'll take, you know, odd or even numbers effectively. This is, this sets it, uh, well, it's not a square wave. It's just a rate. I don't know if that makes it a, a sawtooth or triangle or what. It's just, or a sine wave. I don't really know what, what rate, you know, what the wave looks like that it's doing, but mode two, you can't use it with channel two. Well, it's useless for producing sounds that this PC speaker won't use it because it's too fast. For odd, there you go. For odd reload values, the count is always set to one less than the reload value. Re the reload value is the, the number that you send that the frequency will be divided by. So I'm sending 1193, or I will send that, and that would be the reload value. When the counter in the PIT reaches zero, it resets to the given value that you sent it. It'll reset to 1193. And then when that counter reaches zero, it sends out an IRQ zero. So in this case, if you set channel zero to be this. So effectively what I'm doing is we're setting a number within the PIT that says, okay, on every one of these, you know, triggered things, whatever, it looks at the counter and it decrements by one. So if I set one, one, nine, three, you know, this many times per second, 1.19 million times per second, it'll decrement that counter. When that counter reaches zero, it sends out a pulse on the IRQ line to the pick. So every 1,193 times, this rate decrements that counter, it sends out one IRQ zero, you know, for channel zero. So that's why it, the IRQ is a separate frequency. That's why there's frequency dividers for this, this oscillator that it uses. In my case, I'm, I'm going to be doing one millisecond. So every one, one, nine, three decrements of the counter, it'll hit zero. It'll send out the IRQ zero. It'll reset the counter to one, one, nine, three, and it'll continue. It'll always be at this rate. You're just saying, how many times are you going to hit this rate that I want to send out the interrupt? So bad explanation, but that, that might make more sense now. I'm going to be using mode two to set channel zero for a more uh, granular timer. We'll say more, more precise. Otherwise, I could send 1194 um, and do a square wave generator, and that'd be fine as well, or 1192. We would just get either 999 or 1001. And it's like, I want one second exact or with you know a little bit of change. So that's why I'm setting mode two. And 1193 is an odd value for the counter, or reload value, as, as they call it. It's easier for me to say it's a counter. <laughs> it's decremented when it hits, but okay. One one nine three uh, divided by one one nine three equals close enough to a thousand. So that's why I'm sending that. It'll divide it by that, and that'll work because we'll send the first eight bits and then the second eight bits. Clear interrupts. Set that. Set interrupts, and it should be at a, about one thousand per second rate. So I think performance might be degraded a lot because it'll be drawing that text a thousand times a second. And this is where I was saying earlier, QEMU does not have an accurate PIT timer. This is still going at, I don't know, the default rate or kind of slightly over. But box, if you want to use a good rate, box is uh, good for that, usually. But box is usually slower, so I'll set a, a smaller, smaller window. So yeah, it also prints way too much, and uh, I have some other issues. I have an interrupt handler, but for something that got set off, I just have a default interrupt handler. Um, but this, if it was running full speed, would be closer to a thousand a second. But I'm I'm gonna stop printing so it doesn't have you know performance degradation. Just wanted to show that the number does change and it is updated. It did take effect effectively. And you're like, where are you going with this, dude? You're just saying a whole bunch of words that don't matter. And that's true. <laughs> that's true. So where am I going with this? I am going to um, implement a sleep syscall, which will kind of halt and wait and not do much for a given input number of milliseconds. That's why I set it to 1,000 hertz effectively. So it, um, every one second, one thousandth of a second, the RQ0 will be hit. This here, this function here. 
And uh, we can sleep for a given number of milliseconds by just having a counter that we set and like decrement, right? So I'm just going to do that. Um, I'll have it be a 32-bit number max because I'm still on a 32-bit OS. Let's call it timer to, or um, let's do sleep, sleep timer ticks. Sure, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> um, I'm going to set that. So I'm going to have somewhere in memory that I put this number at. Otherwise, this won't be accessible to like user space programs or anything. What I really should do is make like a, a separate file, like a header or something that holds like these global memory addresses I add because I don't remember what I set. I'm pretty, I think 1700 is free as a memory address. So I'm going to set what, a number here. But I'm not going to remember that in the future. It's a bad magic number. Sleep timer ticks area. So I'll know what that means. Higher Q0. Definitely know what it means now. <laughs> and I guess I'll set it in the kernel as well. Okay. Because I'm going to have a sleep command that I call from the shell. So I'm just, I'll put that in the in the kernel right now okay so what am i doing with that i'm going to take a value or set a value at that location but in this irq0 i'm going to decrement the value effectively so if i set a value we'll do this if copy the word here if above zero, or I could do this, but that doesn't, I don't know if that reads better or not. I'll just say, if this is above zero, then we'll decrement. But I'm getting the value from that location, right? So I need to dereference that. But then I need to set it back into the location. So let me just make this like, this doesn't need to be static in this case. Um, I'll just make it a pointer, a pointer to that area. IRQ, zero, sleep, help me, six timer area. Thank you, Vim, built in, autocomplete. So if that number is zero, dereferenced, because it's a pointer, then I need to dereference it first, right? And decrement that. I think I need parentheses for this. So dereference the number, decrement it, which will set the number at this area down by one. That's all this IRQ is going to do right now, this IRQ0 handler. I'll have a separate function for the actual, like a sleep syscall that I want to implement. I will do that, and that would be in the syscalls file. So of the kernel, right? That'd be two. That's so why you do this when it's not um, tired sleepy time, so you're not tired and sleepy when you're trying to do things and think with your brain. So it doesn't work as well, but that's okay. So I want to make a shish call. So I'm going to update the syscall number. What is that? Control A increments a number. Look at that. Beautiful. Thank you, brain. You remembered something. Bam. Don't even have to mess with it. So I'm going to add another function in here. Add function in here. This will be for sleep timer ticks thing. Or sleep. A sleep syscall. Yeah. So I'll do sleep. For a given number, I'll have two separate ones, one for second, one for millisecond. I know Linux or in BSD provide like nanosecond granularity. I'm not gonna go down that rate right now. I'm not making atomic clocks or anything. Maybe later on, but right now, I don't even have a performance enough environment that would account or need nanoseconds. Maybe later if I'm doing advanced scheduling or other things, performance testing. I don't know, that's way in the future. I'm just gonna worry about millisecond granularity right now and regular seconds, which will just be the number times a thousand. I'll have two separate ones, actually. Or wait, no. That can be outside. The syscall, the syscall will be one. It'll just sleep for a given number of milliseconds. When I call the syscall, I can input a larger number to make it effectively a number of seconds. But I'll just have this be a number of milliseconds, because that's easier um, on me. So we'll call syscall sleep. These don't take anything in, right? Nope. Okay. But they can be passed in. I'll say we'll pass in as a parameter. I mean, EAX will have to be the syscall number. So another number, I'll just use EBX as a second param. That's easy for me to remember. I know it's not a standard 
sys5 abi or whatever but i'm going to say as inputs ebx is going to be the number of milliseconds so i'm not going to have that as a parm here is why i'm saying that these are still going to be like void okay so how am i going to do that i'm actually going to copy this bam look at that that's why this needs to be like a global declaration otherwise this is copied and it might say it's redeclared well no this is scoped to the function that should be fine i don't like duplicating this though because that's bad although this thing is sort of not changing whatever i'll just worry about that later <laughs> yeah i don't need to make it static or anything because it'll be set there okay take something in from assembly I'm going to put it into this. Okay. So the syscall, the syscall when the user calls this, which will be int 0x80 to call the syscall, and then EBX, or wait, EAX will have two, I guess, because I'm going to add it here. So EAX will be two. EBX will be the number of milliseconds to sleep. So I need to get that value from EBX that we want to sleep, and then I'm going to put that value into memory at this area so that the next IRQ tick will take that value and decrement it for however many, in this case, milliseconds we want to sleep. If the PIT was set to a different rate, it would be that number of ticks. So in this case, I'm going to use it for milliseconds, but it'll really just be the number of ticks we want to sleep for. It, it, if you set the PIT channel zero to a rate that isn't 1000, it won't be milliseconds, right? But this example I'm saying, it's, it'll be milliseconds. Um, but I need to get that value from EBX. So I'll do that here. I'm just going to move uh, be long. I think we need the, the specifier there, the suffix, right, for at t syntax. So ebx will be zero. I don't know if I need double percents for this or not, but I'll just put that there. So I'll say our first parm as we won't have any inputs, but as output, I'm going to overwrite that this value here. So I'll just have this be this, actually. I'll do this. Uh, I want to overwrite a value. I could do memory or register. We'll have it be a register, sure. We'll, we'll prevent it from optimizing except for a register, and this will be sleep timer ticks. Okay. Actually, I could have this, because this will just be a, a pointer to the thing, right? So I could have it like this. Um, so if this points to this area, then we're getting the number from EBX and we're setting that number in this memory area to whatever number was passed in EBX. And we're just setting, this is a register, this doesn't matter. This just says, hey, the assembly's probably gonna be like, you know, <laughs> taking the data at EDX or whatever. Something like that, but anyway. That should set the number, so that's all we have to do to set that. And then the IRQ0 will be passively running in the background this whole time. So we'll just wait inside of this function here and not do anything until the number of ticks have passed. So effectively, if it's set to go 1,000 times a second, um, we're just gonna keep waiting until that number is zero. And if we send like 1,000, then it should wait 1,000 times, effectively waiting one second within this function here. So how do I wait within this function? I'll just have a while loop. While this number is above zero, you pretty much don't do anything. Although when a system call is called, I don't think I said it here, but effectively when this is called, it's like an interrupt and interrupts aren't really going to work. It, it'll effectively like clear interrupts here until I return. So I'm going to um, do a little bit more assembly. Why not? I saw a little trick here on either OS dev or some forum link or whatever it linked to did this. So I like, I like how this solution was. Um, I think interrupts were effectively cleared at this point in the code for some reason. So I'm just setting the interrupts so that the IRQ0 can run. I'm halting until an interrupt is gotten. So like if it's the IRQ0 or something else, then this halt will be stopped. But until an interrupt happens, this will halt the CPU to save a little bit of power and resources and stuff. And then I'll clear the interrupt when it gets back to here after an interrupt has happened. We'll clear interrupts to give time to check this number here without it being affected again. And if it's above zero, we'll set interrupts, we'll go on, you know, so on and so forth. 
um, until it's zero. So once it does equal zero, this will go on. We'll return, interrupts will come back because we'll go back to this stuff here. Okay. But effectively, this will set the number of ticks to wait, and it'll wait that number of ticks. So if it's running at 1,000 hertz, and we wait 1,000 ticks, it'll wait for one second, hopefully. Assuming this works, we'll see. I want to check that from the kernel. I'll put a couple of sleep commands here. I'm going to put a regular one, and I'm going to have a millisecond one, just to have some differences. ms sleep, m sleep. Um, this will be sleep, and this will be m sleep. That's easy enough to remember. Sleep for a number of seconds. Sleep for a number of um, commands will be down at the bottom somewhere. So go up from the bottom. I do need to have a better structure here <laughs> and maybe implement the shell as its own separate program and make just better overall structures because this is not great trying to find stuff sometimes. Um, but the last, the last command is somewhere down here. Yeah, this is change font. So below here, before we're checking files, I'll just put it here. Sleep command. M sleep command. I did this with string compare. So I'll grab that line. Just do this. So tokens, this will be sleep. String length will be sleep. This will be M sleep. I don't want to do that. At the end, it'll continue. If I do sleep at the cursor, um, it won't print. It won't go back. The prompt won't go back. So I'm going to put. If I just do a continue, so to put it back on the next line, yeah, I'll print a new line at the end. Okay, so what do we do here? Well, it's more assembly, of course. <laughs> Sleep for a given number of seconds. I'll just fill out these here. Sleep for a given number of milliseconds. Okay. So we do need to put assembly here to actually do the system call, since it'll be an int 0x80, right? Except this is a literal or whatever it's an actual number so we need to put the dollar sign there because at t syntax is fun i'm still going to do this i just had to look at, at my notes and stuff um i did this a different way but i'll, I'll do this first and then i'm going to abstract this out um, into a separate like header file but i'm going to do this first just to show that hopefully it works <laughs> due to the system call we do int 0x80 where eax is a value so let's move I guess long two. Yeah, we'll just move two into EAX because it needs to be two for the sleep sys call. And then the next thing it'll run is int 80. Okay, but then EBX also needs to be a value. So actually, I can do this by setting things easier. We'll just call int 80. Um, as output, we don't need anything. As input, I did the other thing wrong. I just realized. I hate inline assembly. <laughs> No, it's okay. Uh, the other thing? No, I don't, of course. Is it in syscalls? I know I have three things open and this looks terrible. I apologize for that. It was in syscalls. Okay. Let's close that. Let's open that. Here, these are output parms. These are input parms. So this... I need here, right? Because this is output. As output, I want to set the sleep timer ticks. <laughs> yeah, as output, I want to set a register value, which effectively is going to be pointing to, to this number, this variable, which is at this memory area. <laughs> so I just forgot the, the colons here. So as output, I want to set this. As input, I don't want to set anything. Just make that clear. Okay, but in this case from the kernel as a command, as input, I want to set things. So before the system call command is run, this int x80, I want to set 
the AX or the accumulator A, that register, with a 2, just a literal 2, and I want to set EBX or the B register um, with the number of milliseconds we do. So if I input that in as the shell, that'll be the second token. So it'll be like tokens plus 10, but it'll be a number. Um, what I'm going to do to make that a little bit easier is, is change this a little bit or add, add a new function. Okay, so it will be tokens plus 10, but I was thinking the other day it would be really nice if I had a do I if I want to ever use it for situations like this. <laughs> Because then I don't have to turn this into a number within this here. I can have a you know thing set in C to do that. So I'm gonna have a little I'll have an A2I function, we'll say. And that'll be the number of seconds we sleep for the sleep command. Uh, but if I want EBX to be the number of milliseconds, then it'll be unchanged within milliseconds, but the seconds would be multiplied by a thousand. So We'll multiply that by a thousand. Okay. If I put at the terminal, at the shell when I log into the OS, if I put in sleep one, it's going to go to this command and it's going to sleep. It's going to input 1000 as the number of ticks I want to sleep for at the default thousand hertz rate. I'll multiply it by a thousand to get the number of milliseconds. If I put in M sleep one, I'm just going to sleep for one timer tick, one millisecond. So that's why I'm multiplying this by a thousand to convert milliseconds to regular seconds. That's what's going on there. But I do not have an A2I. I have to make that first. Well, then I will just do that as well. I will just do that as well. I don't want to make a directory. Um, what is that normally in? Sorry, standard lib? Okay, well, I'll make a standard lib file just to confuse things even more. I will make my own C standard library. I don't need your stinking badges. I'll make my own. Standard live.h. And we'll dollar underscore that to get right back in there. Okay. C standard library functions. Is that the name? I don't know if that's what it stands for, because you also have like uni standard, but that might be that's not Unicode, I think that's Unix. But whatever. I'll just say this is C standard library. I don't know if that's what it actually stands for, so. Hence the question mark, but whatever. We'll have A2I, which will return up to a 32-bit int. So A2I, or a better name that I like, is string to integer. But, you know, originally C had a six-character limit, so they went A2I. So we'll do that just for people being familiar with it. And what am I going to take in? I'm going to take in a string. So I'll just call it a string, or number string, or whatever you want to call it. We'll return a result eventually. We'll just have a result here. We'll initialize that sucker to zero. Probably be put into the BSS section because that stuff's always good. Okay, so for I, I'll make zero. Instead of messing with the pointer, instead of messing with the string, just check if, check if string I exists, which you can do like that, or I guess to make a little bit more sense, if it's not null, so it's not equal to backslash zero there, and I plus plus. Uh, but okay, so how do I convert a string to a number? Well, we're assuming we're sending like 0 to 9 here. I'm not checking if it's hex yet. Convert ASCII string to integer. There we go. I don't know. I'm not messing with hex. I guess that'd be like a to-do item later. Because this probably does handle that. And it's probably not hard to handle. Just check if the first two characters are 0 and x and then do a base of 16 and not 10, but whatever. Handle hex strings, hex number strings, uh, e.g. first two characters will be 0x or x. Okay, we'll do that later. Right now, I'm assuming we're not doing hexadecimal, so we're just going to decimal, transfer it into a number, will be the previous result times 10, added to a converted string value so string i minus zero yeah so that'll work so if we're given something like 123 result will start at zero it'll equal zero times 10 which is zero then it will add in the character minus zero which is effectively minus uh like 0x30 right something like that which will convert that back into an integer because ascii is cool so we'll get a one 
then we'll increment i is the index here. The string will point to character two. So one times 10 is 10, plus two will be 12. Then we'll go to the next one. 12 times 10 is 120, plus three is 123. So this works for numbers. So that's good. Assuming it's up to a max, I'm not checking for int max. So, you know, that's another thing I could check for for error handling, but we'll keep this very simple and just do this right now. At the end, we'll return whatever we got, the result. Okay, that should hopefully work. So I'm taking that down here as a sleep command. Um, as the second token, that's gonna be entered as the shell. So that integer times 100, times 1,000 rather, for number of seconds from milliseconds, and just that number for number of milliseconds. Okay, but then I have to include that. So I'm gonna include that at the top. But it won't be A2I, it's standard live. Okay. Hopefully I got everything. Did I get everything? <laughs> we should be able to enter in sleep or M sleep, which will sleep for a given number of milliseconds or regular seconds. We're already setting the channel zero to go at a thousand hertz. So that should be okay. We have the syscall set up to handle that, which will get the timer ticks, put it in the area, and then IRQ0 should pick up that number. Um, let's go down here. Here it is. It should pick up that number and keep decrementing it. Till it is zero. Thus making us wait. Okay. I think that's all I need for a sleep syscall. Which I want to abstract that a little bit in a second. But hopefully that's all I need. Um... QEMU is not as accurate, so I'm going to use box to check this. I mean, I can't, I don't have a timer going. I don't have the real-time clock IRQ up yet, so you just have to trust me that I'm telling the truth here. I do have a clock down here at the bottom, but my face is covering it. If I move this up here, you know, I do have a clock here. I thought it was later. It's only, it's only almost midnight. That's not too late. I feel more tired than I should be. Um... You'll have to trust me that this is like accurate to wall clock time. I guess I can hold like a timer up on my phone. <laughs> do this a terrible way. Or Windows has like a timer, right? Do I, have a, do I have a separate timer that I can do? And like just have one up. Oh, here, here we go. Okay. I don't know why it's at 1530. I don't want to do that. Stopwatch. Bam, there we go. Okay. It's going to be very awkward because I have to bring this back on the screen because it's not going to be in focus, <laughs> right? So that's very nice. It might be easier. Actually, I can do that. Does that keep that in focus? It does not. Oh, I hate Windows like a lot of the time. Let's put this over here. <laughs> this is... Okay, this is terrible. Okay. Let me put in nothing and just do that and make sure it works. All right, let's try to sleep for five seconds. So I'm going to do that when this hits 40. And it returned immediately, so nothing happened. What if I do M sleep for like 10? It returns immediately, so I know that's not working. Okay. That's good. I did the whole horse and pony show and just killed the horse and struck the pony, so nothing happened. And... Control X. Well, at least I know it doesn't work, so that's good, right? So why does it not work? I am calling hex 80 with A set to 2. Is this output or input? This is input. Yeah, A set to 2 and B set to the number. It should not be returning immediately. It should be going to the system call. No, those should be correct. I think it's something with the numbers not matching up, right? Probably. In syscall sleep, I put his number two, right? Zero, one, two. Wait or sleep until the text is zero. Um, oh, oh, this only gets the number once. Is that the issue that I have this in here? I think this is the issue. This move EBX line looks correct from what I have. 
Okay, so I think it's because, I don't know, because I have this redefined or something. So I'm going to take this out. I'm going to just include the other file in here, which is probably not the best way to do this, but pick H is where that is set, I think. And then we have this area set, and that's set in the other one, so I can get rid of that. Mm, yeah, that's set in here. So if we, if we have this one included... Um, then we need this to be global. This would have to be like up here. Yeah, so this would have to be up here, and I don't think that needs to be static, though. We'll just set it as a pointer. So that way we only have this set in one place globally, instead of multiple places, which may have been messing it up, possibly. Maybe one area where it was messing up. We'll see. I don't know if that's the only thing that was wrong, but I'll check and see that. Possibly. Maybe not, but possibly. Um, so if I sleep, it still goes on immediately. That's not good. I don't know. I know when I did this in testing before, I did have the RTC going at the same time, which might have been setting the clock rate somehow within the emulation. So A2I should be working. I can check if A2I works. I also have this defined in here, which I don't need to anymore. I can check if A2I works. Let's do that for Uno Momento. Uno Momento, I'll check that. Well, whatever, whatever they enter in, I'll do... I'll just go down a line and then print it. So yeah, I'll, I'll do that. New line, let's print out decimal, A2I tokens plus 10 times thousand. Okay. Just to see if we're getting correct stuff. Just to verify. Takes a while. So sleep 10, this should print 10,000. So A2I is working. Sleep 1,000 should print 1,000. This is just print the number I have. Okay. So I know that's correct, which is good. Um, but these other things aren't. It's like the system call isn't being made correctly for some reason. It's weird. Um, well, the, the, the other thing I did want to do, if that did work, was abstract it out. Because, at least on uh, usage, open BSD, sleep seconds. So this is in, or well, it uses what? Doesn't it use something else? I want the C function, right? That's man3. That's in uni standard. Which actually uses nano sleep. So, is that one too? No. Nano sleep is in time. So I'm just going to make a time.h and put it in there. <laughs> put those in there. I'm going to do that. We'll make time.h and... I'll include that here. Time functions. Time related functions. Just to have another C C thing going on. So it'll be this stuff here. Let me call it sleep seconds and sleep milliseconds. There is no disambiguation there. That's definitely what's going to happen there. This can be a constant. Um, the number of seconds we can sleep. The number of seconds is going to multiply by 1,000. So what I'm going to do, I'll make the seconds a 16-bit number. Because it's going to be multiplied by 1,000. And that's going to run over 65535. Well, 65535 times 1,000 is, I think, greater than the 32-bit limit, right? Is why I'm doing that. 
So I'm thinking about doing that. Is that what my brain's trying to tell me to tell you? <laughs> 4, 8, 12, 16. That is greater 20, 24. Oh, that's 28. No, that fits within 32. Whatever. I'm going to have seconds be UN16 because we don't need to be waiting that long. Milliseconds can be larger, though. We'll just say, we'll just say that can be larger. Yeah, milliseconds will be there. Um, yeah, A is two. B is going to be the number of seconds we got. So the number of seconds passed in times a thousand. Otherwise, the number of milliseconds we got passed in. So that just makes it an easier like interface as an API. If it worked, which it doesn't work currently, right? But that makes it as an easier thing to target here. So instead of doing this, since that's called there, I can call sleep seconds. And we know the A2I works of that times a thousand. And for this, I can call sleep milliseconds. And don't multiply it by a thousand. Just an easier interface to, uh, to target. I have to include that, time.h. That's not going to make it work, but I would hope that it would. <laughs> but it's not. The reason I haven't tested in QEMU also is because the PIT runs at a much lower rate than 1000 in QEMU. So if I did, it wouldn't be accurate. And if I did sleep for 10 seconds, it would sleep for like a couple minutes because it's very slow and it's not accurately emulated. So that's why I'm, I'm trying to test this within box. But... I'll just slightly abstract that. That way we can use it in other user space programs and stuff as well. We can call sleep um, from the time.h file. And we can call a2i from the other ones. That's why I kind of abstracted those into those C library headers that I'm using. Because so I can use it within user space programs, not just the kernel. At least later on. Well, that's very slow. That's a lot longer than one second. That should go back immediately. This should sleep for one second. That sleeps for more than one second. Did I mess up sleep? Because M sleep seems to be working. Uh, no, that just does the given number of milliseconds. That multiplies by a thousand. Because this is still going to be... I'll just rename that to milliseconds. That makes more sense here. Milliseconds times a thousand. Although that's the number of seconds we want to sleep, so... Uh, no, it worked better before. Yeah, that's the number of milliseconds. A is going to be two. B is going to be that number. So why would sleep one give a different wait time than M sleep? That doesn't make sense. If I give one, this should be a thousand. If I give a thousand, it should be equivalent. I also don't know why it would not go back immediately now that I did this. I guess including it up here, maybe it was wrong. It was like being set to something else or being after all of these stuff. I don't, I don't know, man. I'm confused. <laughs> I didn't change anything, but I made it again. I'm confuzzled right now. bring this, this bad boy back down here because I forgot I had this timer going. Look at that. Let's reset that. Let's go sleep for five seconds. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yeah, it's definitely slower than one second. Let's do M sleep five. 
Check 10. Why does that go back? Oh, because I did M sleep because I'm stupid. M sleep 5000. See if that does five seconds. No, that goes back immediately. I'm getting very wildly different results here. So I'm going to have to see what's going on, which is not great. So I'm going to try to debug this. I will get back when I figure it out. Okay, I found my issue. It was, again, a dumb mistake because, you know, I do these things when my brain isn't fully awake and ready. And I forgot a thing that I had to do anyway, which may or may not have affected things. So that's very vague. So in, in the box source config file, this is mainly for later because I'm going to use the real time clock, but I think this also might help the PIT as well. I'm not absolutely sure, but I have it in here anyway. Uh, the box config file, there's a clock sort of option parameter, whatever you call it. I don't know the settings for the clock. I'm doing sync real time, time zero local. So taking whatever time my PC has or the virtual machine has that I'm running this. Um, and RTC sync is one. So that should sync the real time clock to the timer, I guess. I don't know, but it should sync things up so Box works a little bit better with timing, a little more accurate. QEMU, I don't think has PIT separate sections. It does have RTC options that I'll be using, but that's in the future. But for Box, because the PIT is accurate in box, as opposed to QEMU, I have these settings. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that in the kernel, when I was doing sleep, because I'm a big stupid doo doo head, um, I was doing multiplied by a thousand. I had this. You know that is all well and good, except in the sleep seconds function here, I'm multiplying by a thousand. So it was multiplying by a million, which is not what you want to do, because a million milliseconds is you know a thousand seconds so yeah it makes sense that that wasn't going to end anytime soon <laughs> i want to just send the a to i you know the token value that's the number of seconds we want to sleep just send that number don't multiply that by a thousand because i'm doing that within sleep seconds to have an easier api an easier interface here to call as this function so i wanted these to look identical and that's what i ended up doing so okay don't multiply it by a thousand twice. Just send the numbers here, the seconds and milliseconds. So that causes it to work, but I will show you that it does work. I also don't know why Box has to wait for IDE to time out every time. If that might be something I have to mess with. That might be something I'm not handling correctly for IDE emulation. So maybe I'll look into that. If you know, let me know. Otherwise, you know, it's annoying. You start a box and you have to wait three seconds for no reason. But anyway, just to have a window here um, until I have the RTC date time going, you know, I can't check that this actually does work. So I have to be very janky and do this for no reason. If we set this off, let's sleep for five seconds. Three, four. So I'll see if this ends when the timer hits like 10. Yep, okay, so that's good. So if we M sleep for 5,000, it should also be 5 seconds. So I'll do this when it hits 20. Approximately. So that should end when it hits 25. Yeah, okay, so the sleep functions work now. <laughs> Don't multiply by a million, multiply by a thousand. Don't be a big stupid doo-doo head like, like I am. And also set clock settings in box just to make sure. I think that also has an effect. But we can sleep for, you know, millisecond increments and second increments. Does that help us right now? No, but it's something to keep in mind that we can use that and we can set the timer ticks. We have an IRQ zero set up that we can change the rate at which it goes, at least for channel zero. We can set the other channels as well, though, with that set PIT channel mode frequency function, which I'll be using to mess with the PC speaker soon, probably. Probably not in this video, though, but we got the IRQ zero working. We got timer, we got sleep syscall for milliseconds and regular seconds. Have a couple more C header functions. So that's pretty cool. You know, we got that stuff set up. Um, so, okay, the next part of this, if this isn't too long, it's probably already like two hours, but I can cut down footage. Um, I'll probably do the CMOS real time clock, which will be IRQ8, so we can get a date time value. So on the shell screen, this is small, so sorry if you can't see it, but you know. 
this is the date right now, date and time. So I'll, I'll have something like probably just the year, date, time, and ISO format um, or USA format. <laughs> Month, day, year, and then hours and minutes, if not seconds for the time. Um, but I'll do that in the next part. So, because I got to sleep and do stuff, but I should be back for you guys in like a second after a fade out. So, see you then. Okay, all right, let's continue this. I'm going to do the PIC IRQ8 or the CMOS RTC to get date time values. Some articles that I have regarding those, some web pages on OS Dev Wiki RTC for the real time clock, the CMOS page. Uh, it's kind of odd that it's called CMOS. I guess it's just called CMOS memory because uh, back in the day that's what it was called in the 80s or whatever. And that was complementary metal oxide semiconductor yeah which is just i mean there's like cmos transistors i think and nmos and pmos and things but whatever it's just what they called it it's supposed to be more non-volatile because it's kept alive on mother or it was uh, kept alive on motherboards through you know like the little button cell batteries like watch batteries and things but i'm not going to reiterate wikipedia pages you can look those up yourself <laughs> i couldn't find anything for cmos like RAM exactly, or what the OS Dev Wiki calls CMOS and RTC, but there is a page, non-volatile BIOS memory, which kind of explain that slightly more. I guess nowadays UEFI has NVRAM, which is non-volatile RAM. And if you do UEFI things, you'll see like NVRAM VARs and stuff, which is non-volatile RAM variables and other config values and stuff. But anyway, that's, that's sometime in the future, maybe we'll mess with that. Um, cause we're still doing BIOS compatible things. So I, I also don't like that they split this into two pages cause you really need to read both <laughs> if you want to use the higher Q8, but that's okay. You can read the date and time without messing with the interrupt, but I'm going to update the date and time values approximately once a second from the interrupt from IRQ8. So that's why, you know, I had to read both these pages. Yeah, APIC or PIT can be used for timing, but I don't know the date and time for the PIT unless I ask the user to enter in the date time on boot, and I just want to kind of grab that if there's an area to grab it. So I don't know if this works on modern computers or not, but emulated, you can emulate the RTC and things. So I'm going to go with that for now. It has a base frequency, 32.768, which is a nice power 2 number kilohertz. Uh, by default, when you enable the real-time clock from CMOS, because I guess it's disabled by default from the BIOS or something, but if you just enable it by setting a bit and a status register, um, you'll get a default rate of 1024 hertz. So effectively, the IRQ8 interrupt will be called 1024 times per second. So if you keep like a little timer in there, just from 0 to 1024, and whatever it is, if you know it reaches there, or the value is divisible by 1024, then approximately one second has passed, and I'm going to update like the date and time values with that. So that's what I'll be doing. CMOS RTC handles non-maskable interrupts, which I don't want to deal with. And a way to not deal with that is by setting the top bit whenever you read or whenever you're going to effect a, very, um, a register within the CMOS here, you can set the top bit or hex 80 um, in the byte that you send over and setting that bit will disable non-maskable interrupts. Some of, some of the examples on this site had it not set, but... I try to set it every time because I don't want to deal with non-maskable spurious interrupts if I can help it. Um, so here they're just reading status register A, setting the top bit to not have non-maskable interrupts. And then they're writing to the RAM. So this works by sending, um, yeah, the two, the two IO ports are 70 and 71 in hex. So you send the register you want to read or write from to port 70, and then you read or write to port 71 which will effectively write to that register. So if you send status register A to 70, you send a value to 71, it'll write to A. Or you can read from it and you can read the value in, in status register A. Oh, I have another page here, which was only available on the Wayback Machine, linked from, you know, one of these pages. Because um, OS Dev Wiki didn't go into in depth about what the actual values are. <laughs> so these are, these are bio, these are um, DOS interrupts. So I'm not interested in that, but. I was interested in the actual registers. I was like, what, you know, what are these bits? What are they doing? Status register A has like divisors, I guess for frequency, but the default rate of 1024 Hertz is fine. So that's what I'll do. Oh, there is one thing we'll do with status register A. We'll check if the highest bit is set and that'll say there's an update. 
So the CMOS sets this bit in status register A whenever there's an update in progress. So we don't want to mess with the date and time values in the RTC if it's in progress. And the, the examples on OS Dev Wiki go over this as well. If you go to the bottom here, yeah, reading all the date and time registers. I'm going to follow kind of what they have here for my IRQ, IRQ8 handler. I'm not going to do a century register. I'm just going to assume we're in the year 2000 something. Uh, but we want to wait if it is in progress and then kind of read it twice and just update the values until it's not in progress anymore. So we're kind of reading sort of twice every time. And if there was a change, we want to get the latest change and wait until it's done updating or else we can get like weird iffy times or dates. So I'm going to follow their example in doing that. But you, you read and basically just check if the top bit in status register A is set or not. By doing here, they're checking the update and progress flag if the top bit is set in status register A. See, what they should have done was set the top bit to not do NMI, but they didn't do that. But anyway, so we'll be checking that. And then status register B will be checking, will be setting bit six to enable the interrupt. If you enable this without setting, you know, the divisors and things, then it'll take the default values in status register A, whatever it's set to, which is usually a 110, and it'll be uh, 1024 hertz. So we'll be setting bit six in status register B to set the default rate. IRQ0 will be fired off of 1,024 times per second. Okay, the alarm I'm not going to deal with. Update ended, I'm not going to deal with. These other things I'm probably not just not going to deal with. Um, but we can check if they're set or not. If bit 2 is set, then we're doing BCD. Or wait, we're doing binary. <laughs> if bit 2 is not set, we're doing BCD. And there's checks for that within the example here at the bottom. Bit four. So this is bit um, two. Um, if it is set, then, well, if it's not set, then we're in BCD, binary coded decimal, and we're converting BCD to binary, which I think mine was set by default in the in QEMU and in box. So I am doing this as well in my code, but, but it's just converting. I'm just copying their formulas to convert values between bases pretty much divided by 16 times 10. Uh, okay. And then we can also check bit one, which they're checking not with two. So if the first bit zero indexed is not set and the top bit in the hour, wherever they get an hour is set, then we can convert 12 hour to 24 hour clock. So I'm going to go with 24 hour because I like it. There's no ambiguity. If something is 16 o'clock, <laughs> it's 4 p.m. You don't know if it's 4 a.m. or 4 p.m., you know, no ambiguity there. Daylight savings I don't give a crap about in real life or in this. So we'll just deal with checking bit two and bit one, setting bit six within stash register B. Stash register A will check the top bit, bit seven, if there's an update. Um, the other things we don't need to mess with, however, we do need to read status register C whenever the interrupt happens. This is on the RTC page. Whenever the IRQ8 is fired, status register C has a bit mask saying which interrupt happened or what type. There's like an alarm interrupt or a regular one or what have you. Because it can do, yeah, I'm just going to do a periodic. I'm not going to mess with update ended or alarm. Um, but if you don't read the value, then the next IRQ8 will never fire. So the interrupt won't happen. If you don't read status register C, then you're only going to get one IRQ. <laughs> so the date will never change. The time will never be updated. Um, so I'm just going to put this at the bottom of my IRQ8 handler just to read it. So, you know, right to the sort of index register, address register, we're going to read C and then we just read the byte and don't do anything with it. Um, I don't think there's anything else I have to go over here. I might have missed some things, unfortunately. They had a weird thing with status register D as well that they mentioned on one of these pages. Register D anywhere? No. Is it on this one? Yeah, register D. So in their example, they have that reading the value after you set the value and you input the byte from, you know, the data or whatever for that register. They say that reading will reset the index to register D. So if you just read again from port 71 after you already read once for the register that you want to read to begin with, then it'll be set to register D unless you change it again. So effectively, when, whenever you read from a register from CMOS RTC, you want to send the register you want to read from 
to port hex 70 and then input from port 71. Just do that every time. And then you don't have to worry about it resetting to another index register. So I don't know why it resets to D. That's just mentioned like once here. So I'm going to have a function. I'm going to have like a struct that holds this info for the date and time. Um, I already have abstractions for reading bytes. Uh, the enums fine. I'll have a thing to get the update in progress. Getting a register will be writing the register to port 70 and then reading the data at port 71. So that'll handle, you know, not dealing with a reset to index register D or anything. And that's a little good abstraction because you can just get RTC register C at the, well, this isn't an IRQ8, but you can call this with register C at the end of your IRQ8. And that'll handle um, only getting the initial IRQ and not the other ones. Yeah. It's, you have to go back and forth. I'm like, I wish they just had both of these in one page, but whatever. Because that's basically what this is doing. But with their abstraction here in their example, we can just call get RTC register and send C. And that would be the same thing. So I'll, I'll have that stuff in my code. It's not that much. It's just, you know, I'm not great at explaining. But I think I covered hopefully a high level of what I'm going to be doing. Um, but okay, so let's... I'll make the changes in the kernel initially to actually do the enable the interrupts here so I don't forget it later. Why does this look different? File type equals C. I don't remember changing anything in Vim. And I feel like this is a lot more colorful in different colors than it used to be. So I'm kind of weirded out right now. Like, why is this? These were green. And this was like green. So. This is my OpenBSD, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's because I'm root. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't need to be root. Just making sure I'm still in the right thing there. There we go. That's weird. Root has a different color scheme. I didn't know that. Now I know. I don't usually edit things as root, so that has nothing to do with anything. Just it's like eh, I could tell something was off. Okay. So in the kernel. Making sure the recording's still good. Okay, in the kernel down here, I need to enable like everything for this IRQ8 that I'm gonna do. So that's why I have this here. So 28. It's going to be CMOS RTC IRQ8 handler. That's sufficiently verbose. So I'll probably remember that. Um, I will have to clear a couple IRQ masks here. So since we're doing IRQ8 to get the real time clock values and everything, um, eight is above seven, right? <laughs> but the PIC, the programmable interrupt controller, um, has like the primary and secondary pick to handle 16 overall interrupts. So the first eight are on PIC one, the second eight are on PI PIC two. Um, PIC one handles IRQs zero through seven. So IRQs eight through 15 are on the second PIC and the second PIC is wired to the first one through IRQ two. So we have to clear um, the second bit, effectively, IRQ2 to enable PIC number two um, interrupt request. So enable IRQs 8 through 15. Well, I'll just say enable, enable PIC2. Well, anything that sends IRQ2 will go to PIC1, but anything that sends 8 to 15 will effectively, will need to clear off 2 so that it goes through to the second pick from the first one. And then we'll need to clear irq eight will okay so that'll enable irq8 to work um, but it is disabled by default so i'm gonna have that maybe here i'll put to do enable RT rtc so i have like a little helper function for that and enable rtc so that should be all i need to do in the kernel once i get these you know function set up. So um, the other stuff I'm just going to slam into this pick file here because everything that involves the pick is going to be here. Eventually I might, you know, separate things out because um, there could be up to 16 different interrupts and all the handling that needs to be done for all those and all the helper functions need that needs to be done. So this file might get big eventually, but right now it's not too unruly, only a couple hundred lines. Um, I'm going to put, I, I don't really need to, but I'm going to put Define another global data area here, memory address to put the date and time values into. 
So I'll just call it RTC date time area or something. Um, and a while back, I don't know, I decided on 1610 for whatever reason. It's just another area that's free. Again, I want to probably extract these into another file eventually instead of having them scattered everywhere, but that's all right. Only the kernel is really going to be interested in this. And I had another little variable later on, which I'll just put here because it's at the top of the file. Sort of like a Boolean. It's going to be, I'm going to have a command to show the date and time or don't show it within the kernel. So I'm just putting it in this file because it's kind of related. So show date time. It's basically going to be a bool. I'll start it out at zero, I guess. But I don't really have Booleans necessarily. I guess I could have Booleans. I, I don't remember how OpenBSD handles their stuff. So I guess I didn't set up the database. That's fine. I think it's in user. I don't know if it's in user bin. It might be user share live or something. Um, I don't remember where, where C files are normally at on OpenBSD. Well, whatever. What, I can just have like an enum or defines or something. So I don't really need one, but I'm going to put a standard bool file to avoid wasting more time. It's going to be like the simplest file you ever did see, right? I keep doing this. I guess I could just, I, I need to get it into muscle memory because I keep changing. Just do dollar underscore. Just take the last thing. Um, Uh, define boolean values. So, put that there. I, I did forget this on the last like episode, so in between I did do one change and that was just adding this to the other, uh, the standard live.h file as well as time, right? Yeah, so I did add that later, but just I'm including that in all my headers. Um, I could do defines. I'll just do an enum. That's fine with me. Uh, we'll do false and true. So this will be zero and this will be one. <laughs> I think that's fine. I could call it bool t. I don't really want to do that. I'll just call it bool. We'll see if that works for a boolean. I don't know if it will. I guess that's what I'm going to find out right now. Let's see what happens. It's under includes, under c. Standard bool. So what if I do static bool show date time and we'll set it to false. Do I have issues? I do have issues. Expected semicolon. Okay. Uh, don't do that. Let's see. Put a semicolon at the end. It does not like type def requires a name. Okay. I must use enum tag. I thought that's how you do that. Is that not how you do that? Do I have to put bool at the bottom? Can you tell I program a lot? Because I don't remember anything. Okay, uh, no, that's, that's how you do it. Okay, undeclared identifier. Yes, because I didn't put that in yet. Just wanted to make sure the bool actually did something. <laughs> so that's an easy way to make booleans. I mean, it's not the best way, but it works. <laughs> this is going to be zero by default, and this is going to be one. So zero and not zero. OpenBSD does something similar. I mean, they have more, they define like their own bool type a bit differently and more, uh, more better, I guess, but more better. That's that Southern English coming out. But yeah, we can set it to false and do true as well. That's the French true. That's how you spell true. Uh, but okay, what, what am I talking garbage about? I'll just type it out here. So I'm going to have stuff to go into that date and time area at the top. I'm going to have date and time values. I wonder if there's a mass way to insert lines in here. I don't know, but. That's fine. I guess I'll make it... I made it packed. I don't remember if I had to do this, but I did it anyway. But I'm going to have a date-time thing. A date-time type. 
And it's going to be a pointer to that memory area that I had. It's going to be date time t pointer to um, RTC date time area. RTC date time area. Okay. So what am I going to put in here? I'm going to have seconds, minutes, hours, day, month, year, right? It's probably it. Second, minute, hour. We'll do day, month, and year will be 16-bit. Because it will be over 255, although we're just going to add it to 2000. You know, it's going to need 16-bits. This will be 0 to 59, 0 to 59. Hour will be up to 24. Day will be up to 31. Month will be up to 12. So, yeah. Date, time, info. All right, I'll have CMOS registers here. So why did I put <laughs> this thing all the way at the top and then the other stuff at the bottom? I don't know. I could put these closer to where they're actually used. So maybe I'll do that. I don't know how to lay out files. So th this variable as well, if I didn't, I'd forget if I would explained this. I don't think I did. Yeah, I'm going to have a command probably called like just show date time or whatever, and it'll print the date and time in like the corner of the screen. So and then I'll set I'll toggle this value within the kernel within the shell whenever they call that. So if, if the user calls show date time once, it'll show it. If they call it again, then it'll hide it. So that's why this I'm just going to have a Boolean here for that. And the reason I'm going to have this in this in the IRQ eventually is um, I'm probably going to draw to the screen within the IRQ, which isn't great, but I figure, how am I going to know that the date and time were updated if I don't have a timer informing me that it was updated? And that's the whole purpose of the IRQ firing off every 1,024 times a second. So that's why I have this in this file. Justify that to myself, but <laughs> CMOS registers here, I'll have a little enum for that. Um, like the OS dev wiki had, the address is going to be 70 in hex. And the data port for whatever register you're reading or writing to is going to be 71. I don't need semicolon. Okay, so the register's here. So status register A will get the update and progress flag. So I'll have a helper function for that. The most update and progress flag slash bit. And status register A. Um, and I'll return a bool. Hey, now I can use a boolean. I'll be using it within conditionals like if or while update in progress. So maybe we'll do CMOS update in progress. So I might call it this. Let's do CMOS update in progress. Um, it won't take anything. I'll do void. So I'm going to write out to the Register we want to do, we want to do status register A, but I also want to set the top bit so that we don't get non-maskable interrupts. We disable those by setting the top bit here. I'll do that. We'll read from status register A. Disable NMI. And then we'll read from that CMOS data here. But we're also going to check if the top bit is set because the top bit from status register A handles if the update is in progress or not. If it's set, then the update is in progress. So within this, we read it and check the top bit. I'm just going to return that value. Ultimately, that should be coerced into a zero or one. So hopefully that works as a bool. If it doesn't, then I'll change this code here. That's fine. This might not work, this might not compile, so I can check that. If register A top bit is set, CMOS update is in progress. Let me, I can check that right quick. I'm in the build folder, so I'll try make. I still don't have that, so let me make that. Let me make that um, function. Da, 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 da. I'm not enabling the IRTC yet. This CMOS RTC IRQ8 handler. Let's put this function here. It'll be void. It'll be down here somewhere. This will be an interrupt. 
because this is IRQ8. So it will need that, and it will take in uh, frame. I don't remember what I called this. But I did call it up here, right? Int frame 32T frame. This is what I want. So copy that. Put that there. Okay. And we'll just do and pick EOI 8 because it'll be IRQ 8. Okay. And that will just have the thing shut up. Um, when I'm compiling. Okay, that does work. All right. So this is coerced into a zero or a one because we're anding it. And I guess that works as return from a conditional to be converted into an int of zero or one. Okay. What other, what other helper functions did I have? <laughs> I don't remember much. Um, get a register. Okay. Get an RTC register value. This one I'll return the full value, so just a regular U and 8. Get RTC register. I don't know if I want to put like capitals in the middle of these or not. Still, is it is it easier to read if I do this? I think it's a little easier to read, but I don't know if it is worth it for going against the, the standards of style that I have, which are none at all. Although I do like comfy sweaters. U and 8T reg register. We'll do register. Oh, yeah, register is a keyword. Um, yeah, reg is fine then. We can even do reg A, but we're not going to do that. So, <laughs> no Marley coding today. Maybe barley coding, but I don't have any beer right now. I will get some. What am I doing here? Instead of trying to log out the clock by talking nonsense, we're going to write to a register that we put in here. So to the CMOS address, the register that we want to write to is whatever is passed in. But to disable NMI, I'm going to or, or that with 80 to set the top bit in the register that we send. Yeah. Disable NMI when sending register to read, right? Well, to read, because we're getting the value. And then I'll end by it from the CMOS data register, 71. I think that's all I'm doing. Return, sorry. Return that value, because <laughs> that'll be a byte of data. Turn data at that. Register. This is kind of self-explanatory, but I'll type it out. Okay, so I'm going to have a couple things here to enable and disable the RTC, because by default it's not enabled, and if we have something later that we want to use in place of this for date and time, or maybe we set this up by default and then get the data from somewhere else, then we can disable it later. So I'll have a couple functions for, for that. Um, so enable and disable RTC. And that will also go along with the kernel where I had that code that I did not call it. I know it's in a comment. Oh, I put a space there. <laughs> So yeah, this will be enable RTC. I think that's all I have to do in the kernel for setting this up though, but okay. Let me also put the command that I'm going to do eventually. Otherwise I'm going to forget what I'm doing. So, <laughs> uh, command show date time. Mess up the formatting. I also don't know for these shell commands, do I want to do like the uppercase letter here and then the lowercase? Because that's like longer to type. It's just harder to read at a glance if I do it like this. But I'm doing M sleep, so I guess I guess we'll go with all lowercase. That's fine. That's easier to type. Show CMOS RTC date time values. Okay. I also have a command that does that because I just put that in. Um, the last command would be at the bottom here. Yeah, msleep. Put it as a to-do. Show CMOS RTC date time values. Just have a thing here. And this will be command show date time. 
Okay, just because I'm going to forget that if I don't do it right now. All right. So enabling and disabling the RTC. So what affects this is status register B within the CMOS RTC area. Um, bit six. Uh, bit six, periodic interrupt enable. So if we read the value at status register B, and then we OR it with, you know, the bit six X number, and then send that value back for status register B, then it will set that and it'll enable the interrupt. So that's what I'm going to do. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to have the value that is in status register B, which I can get, um, call it previous B value. Well, previous register B value. That's a little easier to read if I do uppercase. And that will be the result of getting the RTC register of B, which is 0x0B. And that will work because that will OR it with the top bit, which will effectively send an 8 to disable NMI. So that's fine here. I'll get the value there. And then I'm going to say I'm going to write to register B. 8B to disable NMI. So I need to do this. Um, uh, because reading CMOS register resets to register D. Okay, because according to OS Dev Wiki, reading a value from a register resets it to index D, that register. So I need to reset that we're going to select register B again. Just, you know, and disable NMI. Um, but okay. But then we can write to the data register instead of reading from it, and that can set the value for register B. So I will write to CMOS data this time, our previous value, ORed with the sixth bit set, which I think is 40 in hex. Uh, da -da -da. 40 sets. You know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So bit 6 is hex 40. So that's what I'm going to OR it with. OR that byte that we're going to send over there. Set bit 6 to enable periodic interrupts at default rate of 1024 hertz. Okay. And that should work. I think that's all I have to do. Um... Okay, but if there is, if, if on boot, there are any, there was like a pending interrupt or something. So I, I think this is enabled by the BIOS at boot, but when we switch to protected mode, everything's disabled. So we have to re-enable it or something. So there might have been one interrupt or a couple or something. There might have been one that was like waiting to be read before. And if we don't read status register C after every IRQ is read, the next IRQ8 will not send out. So effectively, when I enable it, just to make sure I can read status register C by just throwing away the value, um, just to ensure that future IRQ eights do happen. So read status register C uh, to clear out any pending IRQ eight interrupts. It might not have been set to IRQ eight before we remap the pick, but It'll be set in the CMOS, you know, data port. So that'll just read it just to make sure. Uh, and this I want to call disable. Disable RTC. I'm assuming the RTC is already going to be on at this point. And I'll have a previous register B again. Um, but I'm assuming the real-time clock is going to be on, so I'm going to clear interrupts and then enable it after we disable. Um, so I'll do that. Okay, but this value is going to be, you know, the result of getting the register again. Or B. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very similar to this stuff, right? I'm going to reselect it again. But this time we're going to clear bit six. So for clearing bit six, we can and it with uh, with BF, which will be 11 and then 15, because 11 is eight and three, but it will skip this bit, right? BF. 
So eight, eight, two, and one makes eleven, and that skips, you know, the bit for bit six here and the upper four bits. So that will clear it. So clear, clear bit six to disable periodic interrupts. Okay, and then we'll set interrupts again. So we don't want an interrupt happening when we're trying to disable them from happening for this. <laughs> so that's why I'm clearing it and then setting it after. But I think that, yeah, that was the last helper function I need. So now we can actually set the IRQ8 here and then check if it works in, at runtime. Uh, after enabling RTC within QEMU, maybe. Although we can check in box and we shouldn't have to do that. But so I'm going to have a local. Uh, struct for this date time t that one's going to be like global but i'll have a local one here irq8 date time i guess i can call it that and we'll have the those values um, i'm going to have two of these actually an old date time i could call it new new and old i guess i'll do that that would make more sense i'm going to get the date the date time values twice to ensure that if there was an update i get the newest value until the RTC is not updating anymore, so that's why I'm going to have two of these. Um, but I did this differently when I wrote it down and I copied. It was dev wiki page way of doing this, but I was like, wait, didn't I make a struct with these values? So I can use the struct here. Uh, but I'll also have a ticks value that will just make uint16t, but we want it to not be reset, so let's make that static. So these are RTC ticks. So I guess that'll make more sense if I do this. So if I set if I set the RTC to fire off these IRQ8s at a rate of 1024 hertz, then whenever this ticks value, if I update it, you know, whenever the ticks value reaches 1024, then we can update the date and time values. So that's what I'm going to use this for, because that will mean one second has passed at the default rate of 1024 hertz. So, okay, before I go messing with all this stuff, I will... Also clear interrupts here in this file, because I might be updating stuff. I don't know if I need to, but might as well to be safe. Yeah, I'll update the ticks value, and we won't have to do any work unless one second has passed. So if the ticks value is 1024, then I'm going to reset it to zero, but it also means one second passed. Okay. If one second passed... Get new date time values. Okay, we'll set ticks equals zero first off. Zero to ten twenty four, and then zero to ten twenty four. So I think that's right. I could also just have it wrap around. I don't know. That's not unde undefined behavior, right? Since it's unsigned. So I could also check if it's just divisible by 1024 and then not ever reset it. And that would ultimately do the same thing. I'm not going to show the tick count. I don't know which way would be better. I had it this way in my notes, so I'll go with this. But I guess I could do it either way. It doesn't matter. That's, that's pedantic. So bike shedding. Always good. So while, while CMOS update in progress. Forgot what I called that. So while the in-progress flag is going, I'm not going to do anything. Or if it's not set, then it'll go on, you know, immediately, effectively. And we're going to get the second day, hour, day, month, year, all, all those values. So I'll get new date time, or maybe this would be old date time. No, because we're going to get it again. Okay, I'll do the old date time first. I'm trying to think which way makes more sense when I type it out. So old date time, and these are going to be allocated on the stack, I guess. That's all right. Old date time dot second. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to think how. Trying to think how autocomplete works <laughs> if it works for this, like going through the struct, because obviously it's not working. So let me just see if this compiles. Get RTC register and ticks, yeah, because I didn't call them those things. Yeah, obviously it doesn't compile if you don't call things correctly. Um, RTC, yeah, and here. Okay, yeah, so I can't do that, all right. 
I know how structs work. I was just confused for some reason. But all right. So the second will be reading <laughs> the second um, register in CMOS RTC. And I realized I didn't go over those things. So apologies for that. The CMOS RTC registers, if you're not reading status register A, B, or C, which are at offsets hex A, B, and C, which is why you send those. Um, if we want to read the date and time values, those are at registers, the ones that I'm going to be interested in, registers 2 for the minute, 4 for the hour, 6 for, well, I don't know if I want the day of the week. I want the date of the month, so I'll probably be reading 2, 4, 7, 8, 9. Oh, one or zero, sorry. <laughs> I want to read zero for the second. So that's one register, zero, two, four, seven, eight, nine, because I don't care about day of the week. Zero, two, four, seven, eight, nine. So that's six. Yeah, six different registers. Okay. So we'll be getting the, I, the RTC registers for these. So the second will be RTC register zero, that byte of data. All right, the minute is going to be RTC register 2. The hour is going to be register 4. We'll have day, month, and year. So the day is going to be register 7. The month, register 8. The year, register 9. Okay, so we get that once. When it's not updating, we get these values. And then I'll have the dreaded do while loop that I never use because I don't like using it. <laughs> but I'm going to get the values again. And then while they don't equal, keep getting the values until they do equal and we're done updating. So actually, these, these might be better if I do new. I t naming them new and old is not the best course of action here, but whatever. We'll say these are new. That's, that's fine. Because I'm going to set the old values equal to new and then get new, new values. Right? Yeah. Because then I can just do old date time equals new date time, and hopefully that works. I don't know if you can do this with structs. You should be able to. Can I do that with structs? Function definition not allowed here. Well, I'm not messing with that, so. A while. I'm not, it's not going to be true, but I'm setting that so I can compile it. So is that good? Yeah, okay. Okay, so you can set structs equal. I haven't done this before, so I was confused whether I could do that or not. Because I know in my day job, um, in RPG, you can set stuff like that. But it needs like a special op code. And the names and types need to be the same within data structures. But, you know, you can set data structure A equal to DSB. And then if the names and types match up, those will equal. So I'm trying to think, what is the C equivalent? I think you should just set this, the structs equal. And that did work here, so... Another tangent, sorry, but <laughs> sometimes languages get, get mixed up, so I've got to make, make them straight in my head. Okay, so if we, get, if we set the old values, then I'm basically going to do this stuff again, which is redundant, but, you know, because I'm going to get the new values again, and then if they're not equal, that means we had an update, and we want to set the values again, and then wait until it's done updating, and then get the new values, and that's why they, there's a loop here. So we get the new values. And then I can check while, um, while old date time does not equal new date time. So this is why I like using structs, but I think I can just check if the structs are not equal and that should be equivalent. So I'm also going to have another thing here for a register B value. So uh, reg B value read from register B after we're done doing this. The reg B value is going to equal gets RTC register B because we need to check the bits in register B to see if we're in binary coded decimal or binary and if we're in a 12 hour clock or a 24 hour clock. So that's why I'm getting the value here. So convert BCD values to binary if needed, and that would be um, if, so if bit two is clear, then it's BCD, okay. So if reg B value and hex four, if needed, this will be bit two 
is clear. Then we'll convert. We'll do new date time, that's fine. So new date time um, dot seconds. Well, this is, I guess, a little bit more verbose if we're doing this every time, but oh well. But we'll have to do this, the value and it, we'll, we're taking the bottom four bits, so the lowest nibble, and adding, adding the value divided by 16. So we're getting the four, the lowest four bits, adding the value divided by 16, which would be Shifting right by four, that would be equivalent, but okay. I'm trying to think in terms of uh, nibbles here. And then multiplying by 10. I'm trying, I'm trying to think why they did this, because before I just copy-pasted the, the equation, I didn't think why they did that. But we're getting the lowest four bits, and we're adding the value shifted right by four multiplied by 10, and that converts BCD to binary. Otherwise, it would be binary 12 for the value 12. <laughs> In binary, it would say like hex 12, right? But we need the actual, the actual binary 12, which is, uh, you know, it'd be eight and four. <laughs> so that's all I'm doing for these. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay. So minutes, I need to change as well. I think hour is the odd one out. So I'll put that there. Day is the same, and month and year are the same. Okay. Yeah, but the odd one out is hour, so. Hour, we're still getting the lowest four bits. But we need to add hour and it with 70 in their example and then we divide that by 16 and multiply by 10. This has another one on the outside. Complicated. Two closing ones. Then we want to or that with our and it with 80 to get the top bit and that will check if it's 12 or 24 hour format. That's what that one's doing. So why 70? I, I don't know. So these three bits are what we're getting. And then we're shifting those three bits over by four. And then multiplying that by 10. Okay, so yeah, because the top bit determines, the top bit an hour determines if it's 12 or 24 hours. So absent that bit, I'm taking the actual hour value that isn't 12 or 24. <laughs> converting that to binary from BCD, and then oring it with the top one again. So I'm keeping that, that top bit separated. That's why these are doing this. Okay, and then we're taking whatever value is in the bottom and adding that to these. So we're, yeah, getting the lower four bits, adding this value to get the full number, and then getting the top bit back in with that oring with it ended with hex 80. Okay, that makes more sense from a bitwise perspective. That's the register B we're checking. Okay, and then we're going to check convert 12 hour to 24 hour if needed, because I like reading that better. So if reg B value and with 2, bit 1 is clear. So if bit 1 is clear, And the top bit is set, it's a 12 hour clock. If the top bit is clear, it's 24 from what I'm reading from this. Bit one is clear and top bit of hour is set in register B. So how do we convert 12 to 24 hour now that we're guaranteed it's in binary and not binary coded decimal? Um, just copying that there. So hour equals hour ended with 7f. So we're getting every bit but the top bit in this byte. We're adding 12 
and modding it by 24. Okay. So we're adding 12 to get a value from, I guess, 1 to 12 to 13 to 24 in case, and then modulo by 24. So value from 1 p.m. to midnight would be 13 to 23 and then 0, right? Because 24 mod 24 would be 0. Okay, so that makes sense. So every, every bit except the top one to get the actual hour value, mod it by 24. Okay. That makes sense. I wish OS Dev Wiki explained that, but they, they don't. Okay, um, so after we're doing the 12 to 24 hour conversions, we can just get, get the year, which is just going to be the year value, but that is not offset from whatever current century we're in. So I'm just going to add 2000. So by the time this needs updating, <laughs> in the year 2100, or whenever this goes out of date, if it's year 2100, then I'll probably have a better solution by that time if I'm not dead. <laughs> if it's by the year 3000, then I'll definitely have a better solution. So af after all this, though, I'm going to set the values in memory in case, I wanna, in case I need these values or I want to read them in some other kernel or user process later. That's why I'm setting them in the memory location. I don't have to do this. I could just write it on the screen and not do this. but. If I, if I want them later, at least I can guarantee they're, they're set somewhere. Um, so I'll do, I'll do that. Um, and that's just set with the regular date time, but that is a pointer. Okay. Yeah, that's a pointer. So we need the arrow syntax. So do I have to do this field by field? I'm not sure. Like, do I have to do this six times? Or can I set date time equal to new date time? Maybe as a pointer. No, because it would go out of scope because these aren't static. But all that would do is result in saving five lines. So I don't know. That might not be worth it. I can just set the individual fields and work that out later. I'm thinking too hard. <laughs> I don't need to think that hard. Just, just set these values. Um, day, month, year. Okay. Um, if we have this show date time boolean and it's in effect, then I will print the values on the screen. Otherwise, we don't need to show it. So I'll just do that here. I'm going to call, I have, I don't have print types. Okay, so I need to put that in here as well. Let me put the C1 on top. Print types h because I'll need to print out stuff. So where do I want to print this out? I do want to make printing better so that I have like set boundaries that aren't just 80 characters per line. I do want to change that, but probably not in this video. So sometime in the future, if I remember, I do want to change those. Um, but I'll put this somewhere in the lower right of the screen, <laughs> somewhere on the right side. So I'm going to do like 50 and 30, I guess. That's what I did before. So these are just test values. So I'll go change later to it exactly in the lower right corner of screen. Okay. Well, that's fine. So at that location, I'm going to print um, as decimal. I'm going to do USA date. I guess I could do an ISO date, though. Would that be better? Because I don't, the USA date's not equivalent. So ISO is. Um, is year, year, month, day, right? But I'll do date, time. And then it'll be hour, minutes, seconds. I think that's ISO formatting. That's what I use at my work, so. I guess we'll go for that. So we will print the year value, which is date, time, year. So we'll do that and Print a dash. Oh, that's not what I wanted there. I wanted both of these. There we go. <laughs> then we'll print the month value and a dash 
and we'll print the day value. I guess if I want the day to be, if I want these to be like, put a zero before them in case they're under 10, I can do that as well. So if date time month is less than 10, if it's one through nine, it would just print a nine, but I want it, I want it to be like zero nine, right? For ISO format. Date time is fun. <laughs> uh, that's fine. We'll print out a zero first. Okay. If it's under 10, we'll print a zero, then we'll print the date value. Otherwise, we'll just print the month value. Okay. And then a dash, and we'll do the same for day. Let me do this. This might read a little bit easier. We'll print a zero, then the day value. We don't need a dash. I will put a space. Year dash month dash day space. Then we'll do hour. And then a colon, but also do this for the hours. Print a zero, then the hour. Um, this needs to be day, hour. So if the hour is less than 10, we'll print a zero, then the hour, then the colon. Just do it two more times for the minute and the second. So minutes. And seconds. I think that'll work. So year dash month dash day space. Um, hour colon minute colon seconds. So I think that'll work. That'll print it on the screen at x fifty y thirty as a character wherever our however big our font size is. That should be all right. If you wanted to do a USA date, you know with. A uh, month, day, year, then you would just, you know, switch these around, right? <laughs> You'd print month, and then a slash, and then the day, and then a slash, and then the year, right? If you want to do that. And I might do different formats later, but right now, just, I'll stick with this. And then after you set, uh, after you get an IRQ8, you do have to read register C, or else you won't get another one. So I'll do that here. read register C so that future IRQ8s can occur. Okay, and then we'll send the EOI and I will enable interrupts again. Because that's what I did to start off, right? Yeah, CLI, STI, okay. Yeah, so this, D, deletes, all right. That should be all I need to do in here. So if I want that to show up, then I need that show date time to be there. Do I have the kernel in here? Nope. But I do have that command here, show date time, which I call, this is with capital, so I don't think, yeah, that's not there. I called it this. So show date time. Make that easier to read here. Okay. So if we did show date time, um, well, I do want to print those out. We enter that in. Okay, sorry. Uh, if I have this, if we did show date time, it should be available from the pick.h that we've included. We have that Boolean show underscore date time. So I should be able to use that here. And I'm just going to set it equal to not itself. So if it's true, it'll be false, false, true, or well, if it's zero, it'll be one. If it's one, it'll be zero, hopefully, by doing this. It starts out at false, so this will set it to true. The next IRQ8 will write it on the screen, and it'll keep writing it on the screen every second, and it will update. But when we don't want to show it anymore, we can type this again, and it will hide it, right? So if I want to hide it, I can do if not, show date time, and we can just... Uh, you know, blank it out on the screen wherever it's it's written to. And I had it as 50 and 30, I think. Yeah. So I want to print out, it'll be yyyy dash mm dash dd space hour hour colon minute minute colon second second. <laughs> Just print it all out as a... Spaces overwrites 
date time with spaces. And then we'll do this for the prompt to go back and then continue on. So we'll see if everything works. I know by default in QEMU it will not. So I'm going to add a more, another flag to that in the make file. That needs to be the last character on the line. It's dash RTC and then I don't remember um, what the value is. So base, I'll do base equals local time. Clock equals VM, or maybe clock equals host. Yeah, base equal local time, clock equals host, and then I did drift fix equals slew, because on OpenBSD it was slow and not performing well, and that helped it actually keep a time of one second per second. Box should keep a time accurately and not need other changes other than what I put in the config file for, for clock. Uh, but this one, I might try it with and without drift fix equal slew. That should add in like missing ones if it if it's slow and needs to catch up. But um, base equal local time, clock equal host. I won't put a space in between, and I'll try it with drift fix equal slew. We'll see. It might be a little inaccurate, but QEMU isn't the most accurate thing with RTC. Uh, but the box source I already have, RTC sync equals one, so that should be okay. But I can try it with QEMU first. Assuming it compiles, which it doesn't, you know. <laughs> Every character needs character. It doesn't like what I did. Okay. It doesn't like what I did. What did I do to mess up first? Invalid operands. Oh, so I can't, I can't just check if they're equal. Oh, that's lame. That's lame as crap, dude. Okay. Lame. That's all right. Where am I doing the hour thing down here? Down here. At the end of here. New date time dot hour. Okay. So I need to check if all these things are not equal. That's freaking stupid. That's okay. <laughs> I can't do this. This is so simple. You can set them equal, but you can't check if they're not equal. That's all right. It's just really lame, you know? Can I copy like this whole thing? I do like Y to copy and then do paste. Well, not like that. I can. Okay. Okay. Let's move this over here and do it there. You're like, what are you doing? This looks crazy. I agree. It does not look good. Let's back up. I know what I'm trying to do. And by doing this, I'm not saving any time. So it doesn't help. Uh, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, I want to copy this block of garbage. Actually, I can copy it with the equal sign. And then I want to go here, and then I want to paste that, and then I want to go over here, and then paste that, and then go at the end, and get rid of these, because multi-cursor editing is fun. Get rid of these, and do while new is not equal to old. Like, look at that. That's all I wanted to do. And then put in like semicolons. So line base, move that over. Looky there. Doesn't that look good? I like that. Except we also need like ors here. So let me do this. Ah, oh, so this isn't great. Ah, oh, that's okay. This, so I don't need semicolons. <laughs> Because that ends the conditional. Oh, I'm not thinking at all. That's okay. I want to go out here. Put ors. All right. This can be a double. Get rid of that. Okay. That looks a little garbage though, doesn't it? Let's move this down. That looks kind of jank, but... I mean, you get the gist of what this means, right? I guess I want that to be like there. So that makes more sense with the while. So while, while the values don't match, so we get the values, we, check, we get new values again. After we set them equal, even though we can't compare that they're not equal with similar syntax, whatever. <laughs> we can do this and just check if any of the values are not equal. Then go set the values equal and then get new ones. And that should update when they're updated and should be okay. 
I'm just learning how to do multi-cursor editing better. So hopefully that's okay. Hopefully that works. Of course it doesn't, which is nice. What did I mess up now? Everything. Incompatible pointer to enter conversion, integer conversion. Character two. Oh, because I did double quotes. Wow. Okay. Okay. Okay, guy. It needs single quotes because double quotes is a string and it will implicitly put a null on the end of these. That's why it said character um, two. That's real nice. Let's do this. Search for double quote. Yeah. Search for double quote. Replace with single quote. Next. Okay. Replace all those with single quotes because C is very pedantic. All right. And then, yes, that is in lowercase, and that is in the kernel. A lot of type in here for not very much payoff, right? <laughs> That's okay. Oh, it compiles. That's good. Okay. Do we actually see anything when we run the thing? Is 50 by 30 big enough? to be seen in an 800 by 600 screen. We'll see. So if I do show date time, we get the date time. Hey, I'm actually really happy that worked without issue. <laughs> it means I can type in stuff correctly. Okay. So we get the year, the month, the day. We get the time, which is accurate because I reset it earlier because NTPD does not like to work within my virtual machines for some reason. It's always out. But I reset the date earlier. Anyway, that's separate. It is, yeah, 618, about to be 619. That's, that's accurate. Cool. And it updates around one second per second. If we want to check that, we do have sleep functions now. So I can sleep for five seconds when it hits 19. And we can see if it ends when it's 1905. And it doesn't. <laughs> oh, because why would it? That would be too easy, wouldn't it? Infinite sleep. Do I still have that issue with infinite sleep? Let's see if it runs with um, millisecond sleep. It might just be an issue with QEMU. Uh, we can also see if this hides the time, and it does. Okay. Okay, yeah, that, that is an issue there. Okay, does that work in box? I do love messing things up and not knowing why. Not knowing why they're messed up. That's always fun. No, box works. Five. Oh, well, M sleep five. Yeah, that's not going to work. So this should end when it hits 15 seconds. Yeah. Okay. So box works with sleep and M sleep. QEMU is a little, mm, a little not great. 500 milliseconds should be half a second. This should be two seconds. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can see if there's any difference in QEMU if I take off drift fix. We can see. I don't know if there will be. The reason I'm doing 800 by 600 16 bit is so that this is faster to um, to work, more performant. Although I still need to fix the graphical error. Uh, foreground will have six, two, three, four, five, six. So why am I doing that? So you can see this issue more. And <laughs> if it's below 32 bit per pixel, maybe 24 is okay as well. But 16 bits per pixel and 8 bits per pixel have this line here at least. And that's because I'm, you know, doing the rendering wrong, right? I'm writing the pixels uh, too much and it overwrites the data because I'm writing 32 bits at a time, even if it's supposed to be 16. So I have like two black pixels there after every line, which is not great. So I do need to fix that. But this should also be on screen and it's not. So that's good. Oh, there it is. It took a second to update. So without drift fix equals slew, it does not work. Okay. At least on my OpenBSD setup. I think on FreeBSD it was okay, but I'm going to include that by default. And if you want it off on your machine, you don't need it, then 
you can remove this flag. <laughs> but I'm going to put it there for OpenBSD. Uh, put note. Remove. Drift fix. Equals slew. If not needed, it is needed for my OpenBSD setup. Okay. All right, but we have date time values and we can sleep accurately in box, but not QEMU, but I'm going to assume that's okay with people. Hopefully I am showing that we do have stuff that does work, at least partially <laughs> in stuff. We have date time and we have sleep. We have a PIT working. We have CMOS RTC values working. I don't know why that default interrupt gets called sometimes, but whatever. We can sleep in micro sleep or millisecond sleep rather pretty accurately. And yeah, so hopefully that's enough for this video and, and you learned something or you didn't learn something. But um, that's all I'm going to do for this. And the next one, I'm probably going to do IRQ1 for the keyboard. And since we have the PIT set up, I'm probably going to do a little bit of messing with the PC speaker. If I can get sound working within my OpenBSD VM. If I can't, then I'll use FreeBSD where it does work. But I can mess with the PC speaker to get basic square wave, single voice sounds. <laughs> there's not uh, polyphony, polyphony, however you say that. There's not multi-voice for sound, there's only single. Um, but we can set a square wave frequency of the current uh, hertz value for a given note. Like standard A is 440 hertz. And we can have the PC speaker play notes. And then if sleep works accurately and performantly enough, <laughs> Then we could sleep for a certain amount of milliseconds while playing different notes or not playing anything or resting in music and we could play songs potentially that might be some some little fun we could have we'll see but that i'll probably do that for the next episode and then after that i'll get back to stuff i was thinking about before either in assembler or virtual memory or malloc or something so um but as always let me know if you want to see something specific that isn't those things or if you do want to see those things either one um, and I hope you enjoyed and you learned something. Thank you for watching. I do really appreciate that people watch these. These are more of me archiving as I go along and I get, you know, scatterbrained and stuff, but I appreciate it. So thank you. And I will see you on the next one.